Hello, and welcome to Field Lab Earth, the podcast that's all about past and present advances in the fields of agronomic, crop, soil, and environmental sciences. Today, for part two of our series on food security, we'll be talking to Dr. Philip Simon about wild carrot relatives and stress tolerances. What role does carrot play in the global food web? What wild relatives does it have? How can crossbreeding with other varieties improve food security and stress tolerances worldwide? Answers to all these and more coming right up. We also want to say a quick thank you to our very first sponsor, Gazmet Technologies, the maker of the GT5000 Terra, the smallest portable FTIR multi-gas analyzer for greenhouse gas and environmental research. Measure carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, methane, nitrous oxide, nitric oxide, nitrogen dioxide, ammonia, and water vapor in real time, simultaneously from static or automated chambers. Visit www.gazmet.com, that's gazmet spelled G-A-S-M-E-T, or email sales at gazmet.com for more information. I'm your host, Abby Morrison. Let's talk about science. Hi, everyone. Today, we've got uh, Phil Simon with us. Phil is a USDA ARS research geneticist and professor of horticulture at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. His research in vegetable genetics and breeding has focused on carrot improvement, though he's also worked with garlic, cucumber, and melon. With the help of students and collaborators, he's developed breeding tools, including the sequencing of the carrot genome, and has collected carrot and other vegetables in 10 collecting expeditions. He supervised the training of 35 graduate students, is a fellow of the American Society for Horticultural Science, recipient of the ASHS Vegetable Breeding Award, and an honorary doctorate from the Agricultural University of Krakow, Poland. He is a past chair of the Plant Breeding Coordinating Committee. Hi, Phil. Welcome to the show today. How are you doing? I'm great. Glad to be on the show. Thank you. Excellent. We're so happy to talk with you today. So we are talking about carrots today. Uh, so before before we get started, we have a very important question. Is there a favorite carrot that you have? <laughs> Is there a favorite carrot? Well, there's. I, I taste a lot of carrots, and there's a, a group of uh, several that are very good. Um, uh, I guess I would not necessarily point to anyone in particular. And one thing I'll point out is that different people have different preferences. Most people like a sweeter carrot, but beyond that, some people like a strong carrot flavor. Some people like a mild carrot flavor. Some people don't like carrots at all. Um, so there's a there's a some of the carrots that I've bred have been selected for flavor, and so those are my favorites. Uh, but uh, I'm not sure you can necessarily find those in the grocery store. The, the carrots that I develop end up in the stream of of uh, carrot breeding materials that industry uses. Um, and so, uh, in a sense, the carrots you eat come from my program. But uh, and some and there we've been working on improved flavor. Um, but um, yeah, I don't really have any particular one. Uh, it's kind of like asking you somebody which of your children do you like best. <laughs> Right, right. Of course, I uh, I actually can't eat them raw. I have a I have like a mild allergy, which is so sad because really? I I love like baby carrots and I used to love eating them, and then all of a sudden I was like, oh, I can't do this raw. But I'll eat uh, them cooked. So I'm still uh, I'm still on team carrot, just okay. not not raw. <laughs> okay. So uh yeah so anyway but moving past the the essential question uh <laughs> so before we launch in here I just wanted to define a term that uh, I'm sure will come up throughout this interview uh abiotic stress tolerance so can you just define that right off the bat Sure uh normally when we're thinking about um how a crop grows successfully we will think about what are the optimal water and temperature requirements, what time of year, um, uh, but also uh, whether there are biotic stresses like diseases that attack plants when they're growing in agriculture. Abiotic stress refers to rather those, those stresses that are not biological like a disease or a pest, but rather stress due to the environment. So you can think of it as environmental stress, heat, drought, uh, freezing, 
those are all examples of uh, abiotic stress that can limit crop production and limit crop quality. Sure. Excellent. Thank you for defining that for us. Um, so you were undertaking a, a project that is pretty closely related to food security, obviously, as, as part of this series. Um, can you describe what is the general overarching problem that you're hoping to address with this research? Sure. Yeah. The, the goal of this research was to investigate the possibility of in a carrot breeding program, can we tap into the wild germplasm, the wild relatives of carrots for genetic variation for genes that we could breed into cultivated carrots that allow them to grow better under situations of abiotic stress? Excellent. And and can you also uh, talk a little bit about why you chose carrots? Why are they so valuable? What's their role in kind of the global food web? Sure. Uh, I, I chose carrots because it was an open position when I was looking for it. <laughs> but but I, was, uh, I was attracted to carrots. There were other open positions. Uh, I was attracted to carrots because, um, to be honest, carrots have a generally good... Um, Good, good expectation of cons- among consumers are viewed as a as a positive crop, and I and I I knew and I know that carrots provide valuable nutrients, and I thought that would be an interesting thing to be including uh, in crop improvement when we look at this larger question of what because the the goal of my project is to answer the question what can we do from a plant breeding side to improve the carrot crop for growers and for consumers. And so carrots were attractive because of the fact that they're a a crop that does provide valuable nutrients. They have a good image among consumers. And uh, so that's, that helped me make that decision. But in a large part, it was because the job was open at the time. (laughs) Sure. Sure. And uh, one, one other thing I wanted to cover before uh, we, we move on to the next section is there's actually a, a, a wild relative of carrot that most people would not actually recognize as carrot, and they see it often. Can you right. tell us more about that? Sure, sure. I'll, I'll bet some of your, the listeners of this podcast will, will know the wild relative of carrot, uh, but uh, in case you don't, it's commonly known as Queen Anne's Lace. Uh, if you live in the eastern half of the U.S., especially the northeastern quarter of the U.S., you are no doubt familiar with Queen Anne's lace. Uh, it grows along the roadside where there is enough water and it's not too hot. And that's why northeastern U.S. is great all the way up far into Canada. And um, this wild relative of carrots right now is blooming by the millions, literally, along the roadsides of Wisconsin, where I'm where I'm uh, located, and um, and I, I'm betting that many of your your uh, listeners are familiar with wild carrot as Queen Anne's lace. This is the very same genus and species as carrots, and so that ties into this project because we're interested in being able to breed for traits that we might be able to pick up from wild carrots. That makes the breeding process easier because, again, it's the same genus and species of carrots, we can cross those wild carrots with cultivated carrots. But that's, but to answer your question directly, Queen Anne's lace is wild carrots. Yeah, this was a game changer for me because I had no idea. And now every time I see them, I it just blows my mind. And we All have right. our, uh, one of our neighbors actually has like these really nice raised box gardens and he's growing carrots in them. And so I'm used to associating carrots with like, you know, the green tops that, you know, rabbits eat and whatnot. And like I saw the flower on it, and I was like, "It's the <laughs> like so." It just it's just completely changed everything <laughs> for me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's been super fun. Um, and speaking of, this kind of got me thinking about uh, something that I I am very unfamiliar with, um, which is just kind of like the carrot life cycle of like what it looks like at each stage because I was like I don't even think of carrots as having flowers but then I was like well how does that work if they don't so can you just sure. at, a, at a high level explain kind of how carrots are bred sure sure yeah so for a successful carrot crop if you're a grower or a consumer 
you do not want flowering carrots. We'll talk about that a little bit, but the carrots that you're growing in your garden to be successful should be carrots that grow nice roots, have have tops without diseases, are not stressed, but they should not be flowering. Um, be, uh, carrots certainly do flower, and they typically flower as a response to cool temperatures. So, um, for instance, going back to the Queen Anne's lace, uh, the wild carrot, those seeds germinate actually late in the fall, right or right before the cold sets in. And so those are small seedlings over the winter. As soon as the frost clears up, there's plenty of cool temperatures that induce those wild carrots to start flowering. And they start flowering right away. Now, the carrots in your garden, you don't want to start flowering right away because that a carrot that starts flowering gets to be woody. So if you pull up that Queen Anne's lace plant, you will definitely smell carrot. And you could chew on it, but it's very woody. Uh, if you can eat wild carrots, but you want to do that before they start flowering, like our cultivated carrots. So uh, with a cultivated carrot, in order to get it to flower, if you want it, you can flower your those carrots that you're growing in your garden. What you'll need to do is uh, pull the carrots out with the tops on, uh, probably take a knife and remove most of the top, uh, and then take that carrot with a little bit of the top left on it, just a, an inch or two of the of the base of the leaves, put it in the fridge for a minimum of a couple months, take it out of the fridge, and then plant that whole carrot root. And it looks just like a carrot that you pulled out, but you're planting it now on the ground again. But after that carrot's been exposed to the temperature of just in your common refrigerator, uh, that's enough cool after a couple months to induce that plant to start to, to grow flowers. So once you plant that carrot after it's been in the cold, uh, it will grow some leaves, but then it will start flowering within a few weeks. So, for instance, I harvested some carrots in Southern California in the middle of March. We brought them back to Wisconsin and we put them in the cooler. We planted them in the in uh, the west side of Madison, Wisconsin in the middle of May, so two months later. Those carrots are flowering right now. We're producing seed on them. So people ask me, gee, I've grown carrots all these years. I've, where's the seed on a carrot plant? There aren't any on the crop you want. It's like beets or cabbages or onions, which are not seed crops or lettuce. Uh, so these are not crops where the fruit or the seed is the item of commerce, but rather they're just they're something that we basically have to grow really as a separate crop. Wow, that is wild. I'm so impressed by this. Uh, excellent. Well, thank you for that. Um, and then I, I don't want to like divert us too much, though. So uh, let's talk more about your research. Um, so you obviously were trying to see how we can breed carrots to have some more tolerances to those environmental stresses that we talked about. Um and you were doing this research in a, in a couple different locations. So can you tell us kind of how you went about the actual research? Sure. Yeah. So we were interested to answer the question, do wild carrots hold promise as a source of genes we could breed in the cultivated carrots for better abiotic stress? So you can look at abiotic stress at the seed germination level, and we've done that in the lab. We can do that in the lab here. Uh, we can look at things like heat or salinity or other abiotic stressors. That's easy to do anywhere in the world where you have a, a lab and you can grow some seedlings. But, of course, to grow a crop, you want to grow the whole plant to, the, to its harvest time. So we're interested well beyond the seedling to that growing crop. So then the question becomes, gee, where can we do some field work to evaluate the ability for carrots to withstand excessive heats of the environment? Where can we grow a field crop where there's droughty land that we could look for drought tolerance? The other thing we looked at is salinity tolerance. Salinity is salt in the, in the irrigation water. It's a big problem in parts of the world where there's a limited water because irrigation water gets salty with time if you don't have regular rains. So we are looking at heat tolerance, drought tolerance, and salinity tolerance in fields. And my, my collaborators in Pakistan and Bangladesh 
were in perfect growing locations to expose carrots to heat tolerance. And they also uh, were able to come to find some regions in Pakistan and Bangladesh where the, where the irrigation water is salty. And also uh, they were uh, growing crops with limited water in some of their fields as well. So we could evaluate drought tolerance. So that's how the collaboration with Pakistan, Bangladesh came. I've got some great cooperators there that uh, could grow the crop and expose it to these stressors, these abiotic stressors in the growing environment, which is where the action is from the standpoint of improving the crop. Uh, great. Yeah, I have two questions off of that. Uh, first, wh why does water get more salty if there's not fresh rain? <laughs> Yeah, uh, because even in tap water, you're, you're familiar. You're with um, with hard water. That hardened hard water is a form of salt, and um, uh, with with the repeated application of low levels of irrigation water, those minerals in the river that's going by the irrigated field, when it gets sprinkled on in small doses, many many times over the years. Each time it's sprinkled on, a little bit more salt is accumulated if there's not a big rain in between. There's big rains, it, it washes those salts away. So in Wisconsin, we don't see much salinity. Uh, but uh, in parts of California, where a lot of the carrot crop is grown, there's significant salinity issues. Some fields have to be ad abandoned. And this is similar with other parts of the world where, where irrigation is essential to grow crops. Wow. I had no idea. That makes a lot of sense. Um, and then my second question is, how did you like connect with these collaborators? Is that through their institutions or Twitter or yeah. just <laughs> conventions? How do you how do you yeah. make those connections? Yeah. Well, I, I've always had some interest in the international agriculture and uh, working on a crop like carrots. Uh, there's not many of us working on this crop. And so Along the way, I had a chance to connect with people that were interested in doing some collaborative research. So my collaborators in both Bangladesh and Pakistan had, before this project, spent some time in my lab. Uh, they had, uh, they had um, uh, put, sent some of their uh, students uh, here to work in my lab. And uh, so we, uh, we had some... Um, ongoing relationships, some ongoing collaborations as a result of uh, this, uh, this activity that we had had in the past. So there was, there's a, a larger project uh, that is funded by the Global Crop Diversity Trust that's, that's looking at the question of where can, can uh, the, the uh, plant breeding community go to use the wild relatives of crop to improve crops. And so since I was working on carrots and had some interest in wild carrots and uh, this, this uh, project funded by the Global Crop Diversity Trust had a has a focus on abiotic stress, I contacted my collaborators that I had uh, developed uh, some interactions with in the past and they agreed to participate on the project. Awesome. I always love hearing how projects come together. So that's uh, awesome. So how did you actually then go about doing this research? Are you just sending them seeds and they grow it? Are they doing the breeding there? How does that work? Sure. Yeah, that's a good question. We, we did, I mentioned before, you can do the germination evaluations for abiotic stress in the lab. So that's what we were doing here in Madison. Uh, we selected a collection of wild carrots. We also looked at cultivated carrots, but for this particular uh, project we're talking about today, the focus was on wild carrots. So we had we had looked at a collection of wild carrots from around the world. Uh, the Queen Anne's lace we're familiar with in the U.S. grows all over the world. And I have been involved in plant collection, as you mentioned, and that involves some, uh, some Queen Anne's lace uh, collection in many parts of the world. And some of these parts of the world are warm and, and droughty. And uh, so uh, we thought that these would be good wild carrots to maybe evaluate in the fields of Bangladesh and Pakistan. So we had some ideas what carrots to grow. But uh, again, the, the beauty of this project was it allowed me to work with my collaborators 
that I had, again, engendered the collaboration with in the past and move them uh, into this project to do the field evaluations in the field in their locations. Hey, science friends. I hope you're enjoying the show. Interested in learning more? Phil's article, Tapping into Wild Carrot Diversity for New Sources of Abiotic Stress Tolerance to Strengthen Carrot Prebreeding in Bangladesh and Pakistan, published in Crop Science, will be freely available for the next two weeks. You can find a link to it in our show notes. If you are a certified crop advisor or certified professional soil scientist, you can also take a quiz for continuing education units for this episode, which can be found in our show notes or on certifiedcropadvisor.org. Thanks again also to our sponsor, Gazmet Technologies. Conduct greenhouse gas flux measurements in the field using the GT5000 Terra. Weighing 20.7 pounds, splash-proof IP54 rated, internal pump and battery, and vibration resistant, the GT5000 Terra is a robust and portable multi-gas analyzer for field work. Visit www.gasmat.com or email sales at gasmat.com for more information. Thank you for being our sponsor. Let's get back to the show. Maybe to back up one little step, um, you know, different crops have different levels of diversity or variation, and carrot is a crop that's highly variable. Uh, you can see that by the shapes and colors of cultivated carrots, but uh, based on the genetic evaluation of carrots we've done over the years, we know carrot is a highly variable crop. So he said, well, this is probably a good sign. It takes that diversity, that variability, to tap into to be a little more lucky and successful in finding useful diversity in a project like this. So, so we, um, I had worked with my collaborators. We had some discussions and picked a collection of about 65 wild carrots from all over the world to evaluate in their fields for the field part of the project in our, in my lab for the germination part of the project. And uh, we got these seeds from the, national collection of germplasm of carrots, which is held in Ames, Iowa. There's about 1,500 carrots from around the world there. Over half of them are cultivated, but a large number are wild. We picked some from around the world from different locations uh, and um, um, sent some seed to Pakistan, Bangladesh. My collaborators grew the, the crops there. Awesome. And, uh, and what, what did you find when you, when you finished growing them? Right. So what we found is that there, what we, what we know as a wide range of general genetic diversity for carrots is reflected in the diversity of performance under abiotic stress. That means that some of these carrots wouldn't even germinate in the salt or the heat, uh, uh that they were, were being grown in. Some of them grew a, a short time and then succumbed to the heat or the salinity or the drought. But some grew full, through the full season and grew just about as well as they grew under optimal conditions. So in order to do an experiment like this, we need to know how the crop grows under optimal conditions to compare it to. So that was a part of the side project in Bangladesh and Pakistan. But in the abiotic stress fields that they were tested in, several of these carrots that we evaluated grew just about as well under abiotic stress as they did uh, under optimal conditions. Not fully as well, but really quite amazingly well. Sure. So you weren't necessarily like trying new varieties that you had been breeding you're just testing the flat like as they are to find ones that perform well and then you would proceed with the breeding those traits in from there right 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 we did we have done some parallel work looking at cultivated carrots similar to what we're talking about today but the focus of this project was to look at this really broad range of wild carrots so typically the wild relatives of plants and animals are more diverse than the cultivated versions. Uh, and um, and so uh, that's the case for carrots. So we wanted to see what the great breadth of wild carrots around the world 
has to offer for abiotic stress tolerance. So then you obviously found some varieties that, that did well, obviously better than others. What, uh, what can you do with that moving forward, both like what are the broader applications and implications of this kind of research, as well as what are some future areas of research that you see with this? Yes. Yeah. So I have a a carrot breeding program focused on cultivated carrots, of course. Uh, And so what we're interested in on this project is is developing new sources of seed, of germplasm, of genes for carrot breeders in the future. Both my program and any other carrot breeding program in industry or academia or whoever in the world might be interested in carrots, we want to have some sources of seeds that so, Abby, if you want to start your carrot breeding program, which you could, uh, I could send you a package of seed and tell you this one is more heat tolerant. So if you've got some land in uh, in in uh, southern Louisiana that you want to grow carrots on in the summertime, or southern California that you want to grow carrots on in the summertime, uh, you, you would want to to uh, be able to go to a carrot that's reliably resistant or tolerant of these abiotic stressors. So in the short run. The, the intent with this project was to develop what we call a breeding pool. What I mean by that is we're intercrossing a couple of these diverse carrots, wild carrots, that are heat tolerant in one case, salt tolerant in another, drought tolerant in another, to have a breeding pool for carrot breeders. So now the process of moving those genes in a breeding program from a wild carrot to a cultivated carrot will take a while. You won't be surprised to hear that when you cross a wild carrot with a cultivated carrot, it looks more like a wild carrot than a cultivated carrot. So it takes a long time. So these will be long-term sources of genes that carrot breeders can tap. Like I said, we have a parallel project looking at cultivated carrots in this germplasm collection that will be a shorter a shorter project, but what we're doing with both of those cultivated carrots that I won't talk so much about, but the wild carrots of this project is intercrossing them. First of all, creating the breeding pool, making those sources of genes available in seed packets that we can send around the world to carrot breeding programs. But then also I am in the process of intercrossing these wild carrots to cultivated carrots uh, we And uh, looking at answering the question, what's the genetic control of this, um, let's say, heat tolerance? Uh, is this a, a simple gene that we can just move around in a breeding program? If you only have one gene to breed in a crop, you can move pretty quickly on it. It gets more complicated with more genes. Um, and so we want to answer that question. How complicated is this abiotic stress tolerance? Because that the, the answer to that question translates to answering another question, how long will it be before I can move these genes into the cultivated carrots? Uh, and so that's where we are right now, is trying to get a handle on the genetic control of the abiotic stress, each of the three that I mentioned, so that we can answer that question for, for carrot breeders into the future. We're using it in my project, we are also doing some, some uh, gene marker work to track genes in the same way that you hear about, you know, there's a gene found for diabetes in humans. Well, um, there are no breeding projects for humans, but if it's in a, in a farm animal or a plant, we, you take that information and you use it then to, uh, in our case, develop a carrot with the, the gene that, that we've tapped into wild carrots for and moving it into cultivated carrots by making these carrots flower, intercrossing them, and then looking at the at the seed that we get from those crosses over several generations and track those genes with some of the molecular tools that we have for tracking genes. And we can do it more quickly now because of those molecular tools. Uh, and uh, again, with the idea of beginning this process of moving genes from these abiotic stress, tolerant wild carrot relatives into cultivated carrots. Sure. Yeah, that's, um, I mean, obviously a lot of, a lot of work <laughs> ahead. Um, some great, great fields for advancement there. 
Um, I want to zoom out a little bit here. How, like, what does this research mean for things like food security or or looking ahead to a lot of the the challenges that we face in food production? Like, why is this research so critical to do now? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, if we look historically at the availability of carrots to global consumers, global consumers in the last 50 years, and this goes for not only carrots, but almost all crops, agriculture has been really good at keeping up with producing enough crops to feed the growing populations of humans that eat food crops and feed crops to feed farm animals and cotton to, for, for fabric and things like that. Agriculture has done a great job of keeping uh, ahead of that. Not to say that there's never shortages, but overall done a very good job. But as we look forward, already we are seeing much uh, more frequent incidents of higher temperatures in our agricultural growing areas, not only in the U.S., but globally. And actually, it's a more acute problem globally. But even in California in 2018, in the summer of California, there were 100 days it was over 100 degrees in the Central Valley of California. That's the epicenter of U.S. carrot production, Central Valley of California. They had 100 days over 100 degrees in 2018. That's a high temperature for most any crop. And carrots suffered that year. They were The growers had enough water without salt, so salinity and drought weren't problems, but there's no way to protect those carrots from the heat. So it's we talk about this process of the earth apparently becoming warmer as time goes along, referred to as, as climate change or sometimes global warming. Uh, for sure, we are seeing some evidence of this happening. And so as this happens, it's expected that this will likely happen in a more regular basis as we move, move forward and will cover larger tracts of agricultural land than is currently the case. So we want to be ready, as ready as we can, to have a carrot crop that's able to tolerate greater levels of abiotic stress as we move forward. It'll help us today. We can now grow carrots. Well, we can't yet, but we can, with the breeding process in a few years, hopefully develop some carrots with some abiotic stress tolerance that we can even grow carrots today in areas of the country and the world that are warmer than we're typically growing carrots. For instance, uh, 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 a later spring crop of carrots in Southern California where they never grow a summer crop. Um, so we can extend the growing periods for existing croplands, but also uh, it's anticipated that agriculture may need to move big parts of their production to different lands. And as that happens, well, the alternative of moving to different lands is having stress tolerance, abiotic stress tolerance. And so in some combinations with other things going on, these materials I'm, I'm confident will be helpful for future carrot growers to have a crop that's able to withstand the the uh, challenges of greater abiotic stress. Yeah, that's hugely important. Thank you for doing that. Thank you to your collaborators also for the work that they're doing. Hi, if any of them are listening, I hope they get to get to listen. Um, I have three questions left for you at this point. Um, so first, I would like to ask if people want to learn more about this issue, this research, uh, anything related to this, where can they go? Yes, I think there's a fair bit of information that's available on the global and to some extent the national level from uh, some of the United Nations organizations, the UN Food and Agriculture Organization. If you Google that, you can find information on FAO, Food and Agriculture Organization, uh, looking at climate change. You can find some information there. Uh, looking more at the plant breeding side of it specifically, there is a group called the Consult, a long-winded name, Consultative Group on International Agriculture. 
uh, ag- excuse me, on international agricultural research. Uh, this is a group that focuses on food security and, and plant and crop germplasm, meaning that diverse collection of things that we cross to improve crops. Uh, and this, uh, this is another organization where you can find information on, on this project and other projects looking at addressing anticipated future challenges on food security as it relates to crop improvement. Um, in regionally, there are local food organizations, uh, and this is very much a lo- can be a very much local activity where uh, you may know uh, local farmers, uh, community supported agriculture type farmers, or maybe you've got got a crop in your backyard um, where uh, you can find more information about uh, the availability of new cultivars, new varieties of crops that better suited for, um, let's say, your uh, your land, which may have salty water, not so likely in Wisconsin, but certainly in parts of the U.S., um, uh, or may have some limited water. You maybe want to grow the crop uh, in a little different time period. So there's that local level of interest and certainly the large and small scale um, production growers that grow the crop for a living are well tuned into that from a national level. And um, I, you know, I guess the whole topic of diversity of crops is an interesting one that relates to this. And so uh, one thing that individuals and, and schools can do is, is just grow various uh, varieties of different crops, something like carrots. We have purple and yellow and red carrots and, and white ones in addition to orange. And so becoming familiar with that diversity at that level, because when you see the diversity like that, you can usually find an abiotic stress tolerance version of it as well, as we did in this study. Excellent. Those are some wonderful resources. We will include links to uh, as many of those as we can in our show notes. Uh, And then the next question is if people want to get involved with this kind of research or these efforts in any way, how can they do that? Well, it, yeah, it depends on the level the individual wants to get involved. There are a number of charitable organizations which have, which look at the question of sustainable food supplies, could be sustainable food supplies for inner cities in the U.S., could be sustainable food supplies for the people of Haiti uh, or of India, something like that. So um, for people that are active in getting involved in organizations where where food supply and food security is an issue, uh, this is a great place where looking at this question of crop diversity is an interesting one you can play a role in. Uh, there's there's uh, this idea that, well, sometimes I get the question, gee, why do we need a carrot breeding project? I've gone to a grocery store. Every, every time I've gone, I've always seen carrots there. There's no problem with uh, the sustained supply of carrots. Well, it's a, it's a crop that needs to be grown. And as we've talked about today, there are some upcoming challenges of growing the crop. But but uh, in addition to these longer term challenges of abiotic stress I talked about, there are local challenges of both year to year variation in, in weather that play into the availability uh, of crops that can lead to s- serious reductions of uh, stable food supplies for uh, certain sectors of our, of our uh, communities in the U.S. and globally. And so this is a place where people can get involved and, and, and use some of this information about crop diversity to say, hey, how about trying some new varieties of rice in these fields in the Philippines uh, if you're working in a charitable organization like that? So those are some places where individuals can get involved in actually playing a part, playing a role. Um, obviously, people provide funding for such work as well, and that's another way to play into it. I would say it's also another way to play a role into it is to encourage the ongoing research in agriculture very broadly, not only in in um, specific things like in specific crops like I've talked about today, but just the idea that we there is a great opportunity to tap into this diversity of crops for all crops, for all traits. And uh, it's it's a. Uh, it's 
programs in seed companies, in universities, in government organizations and non-government organizations that need to take advantage of that diversity and tap into it and see what they can do. So uh, there's a number of different levels that people can play in, can play a part in, in helping to get a more, more sustainable and diverse food supply from the crops that we're growing. And then final question for you is what is one fun fact that listeners would not know about you if all they had was your research? Yeah. Well, you mentioned it. I, I guess, um, it's it's related to my research, but one aspect of my research that has been great fun for me, and I didn't necessarily think about it that much when I before I got involved in working on carrots, is uh, there's there's an interest in collecting this wild germplasm. In other words, seed samples from the wild relatives of crops like carrots, and uh, there's not many people in this world that. Are, that have gone out to do that. And to be honest, today it's almost impossible with with the uh, disease issues we're dealing with. And there's always some political issues with it. But uh, over history, there there's been a long there has been a long history of individuals who've gone on what are called collecting expeditions to get both the wild relatives of crops, but also to visit villages around the world where you might get some local. Uh, variety of carrots that you, there's no way you could get in Madison, Wisconsin, or anywhere in the U.S. And so I've had the opportunity to go on about a dozen different collecting expeditions to places like uh, Turkey and Uzbekistan and Morocco and Portugal, where there are wild carrots. And in many cases, there are local varieties of carrots that we are able to pick up. It's a great thing um, when you start, I remember visiting a village in Turkey about 10 o'clock in the morning. And that's a good time to get to talk to the local villagers because all the men are sitting around drinking tea at 10 o'clock in the morning in the summertime. And uh, so we started there with my, my guide and uh, had discussions with them. And uh, along the way, one of the young men said, oh, my mother has grown carrots. Right now I buy my carrot seed from the local fertilizer store, but uh, my mother has grown carrot seeds. Would you like some? And so we went over to his mother's place and up in her attic, she had some carrot seed and we, 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 she was very, you know, we, we always leave some seed with them um, and make sure that we uh, reciprocate as much as we can. Uh, but uh, this seed today ends, ended up in the USDA collection of seeds. And uh, yeah, just thinking back to that, experience of meeting these people, seeing the wild crop in, in those lands, seeing and meeting the people growing it as a cultivated crop and really getting a, a good handle on where our crops come from historically, because this is really the whole process of domestication we're talking about of crops. Along the way, our ancestors growing the crop locally before it became grown on a large scale. And so this has really been a terrific opportunity to to uh, be on these collecting expeditions. And, uh, you know, I, um, I never left Wisconsin, the state of Wisconsin before I graduated high school. So I was not much of a world traveler, but I've had the opportunity to travel extensively. And uh, to me, that's, that's been a very interesting and rewarding part of my life. Oh my gosh. That's so heartwarming. (laughs) I just really enjoyed that story. Um, yeah, that's that's what we're about. We uh we love that kind of stuff here. So thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you for the research that you are doing and continue to do. Um and yeah, just thanks for your time and being on the show. Well, thank you for the opportunity to talk to you and your audience. And uh I hope uh I hope a few people out there might be uh encouraged to uh get involved in this whole issue of uh, sustainable food supplies. It's a uh, It's a very rewarding thing at many, many levels. Thank you for listening to Field Lab Earth. You'll find a link to today's paper and other resources for this episode in our show notes or on our website. If you have any questions, comments, or recommendations for show topics, please contact us at podcast at sciencesocieties.org or on Twitter at Field Lab Earth. 
If you'd like to hear more content like this, please subscribe and don't forget to rate and review us on Apple Podcasts, Podchaser, Stitcher, or anywhere else you find your podcast if you like our show. We are also available on Lyceum, the world's first audio learning community, where you can join our discussion group and comment on each episode. This podcast is a joint production of the American Society of Agronomy, Crop Science Society of America, and Soil Science Society of America. Special thanks to Lobo Loco for the use of their song Spook Castle on the intro and outro of our show. Opinions and conclusions expressed by authors are their own and are not considered as those of the American Society of Agronomy, Crop Science Society of America, Soil Science Society of America, its staff, its members, or its advertisers.